Well, good morning. Um, if you want to make your way, Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to be this morning, picking up where we left off last week. Uh, but before we do, I have a few super corny, cheesy jokes for you. Um, how much did the pirate pay for his peg and hook? An arm and a leg. An arm and a leg. Yep, yep. And then uh, what did the painter do when he got cold? Well, he put on another coat, of course. <clears throat> and then uh, last but not least, what does it sound like when a nut sneezes? Cashew. <clears throat> yes, cashew. Anyways, um, so yeah, Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to end up being. Thank you for being at church on this glorious Laramie morning. Um, you would never know that we got uh, probably a foot's worth of snow if you account for like the rainstorm we had before um, last week, Tuesday, this week, whatever, whichever day it was. It's in the past where we like to leave it because um, uh, it's warm today and beautiful. Anyways. I'm going to pray for us, and then, yeah, we will be jumping into Mark chapter 9. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us from your word. And, Lord, I pray that that would be the case this morning, because I, I feel like the kind of big lesson that the disciples learn is that there is no power in and of ourselves. And, and just like what Galatians 2.20 proclaims, it is not no longer I who live, but it's, it's Christ who lives in each one of us. And so I pray, Lord, that that would be the case this morning, that we would be encouraged in the fact that you have given us your, of your Holy Spirit, the helper, that he is able to do in and through us and to accomplish your good work here on this earth. And Lord, I just pray that that would um, resonate with us, that your church could be yeah, a, a real source for good and good works and doing good unto others um, that you have called us to do. So, bless us this morning. We look forward to it, to your blessings as you teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. The call of the wild baby is afoot this morning. Um, last week, we looked at what we could call part two, if you will, of the event of Jesus' transfiguration is he and Peter, James and John, make their way down the mountain. Well, along the way, there are a lot of things on the minds of these three disciples, and they use the trip to converse with Jesus and kind of clear things up, some questions that they have in their mind. And so they do. They discuss a, a, a many number of things they actually cover, from prophecy to John the Baptist's role to Elijah to the suffering Messiah. Jesus shed some light on all of these things, all of these subjects, and no doubt it left the disciples head spinning just a little bit. I can probably speak from experience because my head was spinning from last week's study as well. So it was just... A lot, of, a lot of things to touch on, a lot of content, and a very short conversation. And it's been an amazing experience with, that the disciples have had with Jesus. They've been on the mountain. They saw Moses and Elijah. They witnessed Jesus in his glory. And now they've been given some insight into what's next for Jesus and what's next on the Messiah's journey. And Jesus reveals to them that he must first suffer. They're looking forward to this Messiah who's going to reign and be king and set up his kingdom, and yet he now lets them know, hey, I'm coming as the suffering Messiah first. But now it's back to the real world. As they make their way down the mountain, it's back to the real world with real problems. And they don't have to wait long before they are confronted head on with these problems. Because as we see in our text this morning, they encounter quite the scene as they make it back to the valley. We're picking up in verse 14. And Mark writes, and when he came to the disciples, he's, that is Jesus, he saw a great 
multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately, when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and, he answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, and this has to be the most honest statement in all of Scripture. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many even said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can only come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. As you put yourself in the shoes, and I don't know if you do this as you read your Bible, but I definitely do. I try to paint, or paint a picture or make a movie in my mind of what's happening. And I believe that as we put ourselves in the shoes of Peter, James, and John, this scene would be quite the shock to show up to after you've had this mountaintop experience with Jesus. Everything is great. You've seen him in all of his glory. And now you come down the mountain from this spiritual high, if you will, to now being right smack dab in the middle of chaos. There's a crowd, people are arguing, maybe even people are yelling, and you can just feel the tension in the air. I don't know how I felt, or I don't know how they felt at the moment, but I know for me, if I'm putting myself in their shoes, I would be wanting to just turn around and head right back up the mountain. Like, Jesus, this is crazy town, right? And I would much rather just head on up, hang out with Elijah and Moses. It's a lot better up there, right? David Guzik observes, this kind of conflict was exactly what Peter wanted to avoid by staying up on the mountain of transfiguration in Mark 9.5. But it couldn't be that way. They simply had to come down off the mountain and deal with what they found. And as we've previously noticed, and as I've previously stated over these past couple weeks, these mountaintop experiences we can have as Christians that we go through, they put us on this spiritual high, I think, as preparation for the valley. So that you can be close to God, that you can prepare your heart before Him, that you can get intimately in touch with Him, and then head back down into the valley and minister there. But sometimes we feel like Peter, where we just want to make camp and never come down. But eventually we have to come down. And I would say it's even essential that we come down in order to minister to those in the valley. And that's what we see Jesus do. When he came 
to the disciples. So now he, he and Peter, James, and John are hooking up with the other nine. He's, it says, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? An interesting point that was made as I was studying this morning was that whenever Jesus asks a question, it's not because Jesus doesn't know, right? Jesus knows what's going on. He's on the mountain. I'm sure that in his prayer up on the mountain and in his communion with the Father, the Father's preparing his heart for what's next, and Jesus is like, okay, I'm ready. And they head down the mountain, and he's ready to encounter this De- demonic, demon-possessed boy. And so Jesus asked the question, not as like wanting to figure out what's going on, but as an opportunity, it's more of an opportunity for someone to answer. It's not because Jesus needs to know what's going on. It's an opportunity for those present to answer. And so there comes an answer from the crowd. But it's not from the disciples or the scribes. It's from a man in the crowd. And if we set the scene a little bit here, we've, had, we've put ourselves in the shoes of Peter, James, and John. Now we can kind of set this other scene up where they come down the mountain, the disciples are in like this argument with the scribes, if you have ever watched hockey, picture it as like there's a couple guys, they're, they've been scrapping all game, and it's coming down to the, to the point where they're going to throw gloves and go. And so there's just some arguments happening, the tension is, is rising, and you walk upon this scene, and maybe, maybe they're even yelling at each other. And we don't ever actually know what they're disputing about, But from what we know of the scribes and the Pharisees, they're probably accusing the disciples at this point. Maybe even egging them on like, oh, like, you can't cast the demon out. Way to go, boys. Like, aren't you feeling good about yourselves now? Why can't you do it? And so the tensions are high, tempers start to amp up, and then maybe all of a sudden the boy's becoming restless, and the scene is escalating, and then Jesus shows up and gets right down to business, hey, What's going on here, he says. What is going on here? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Neither the disciples nor the scribes are able to answer Jesus before this father interjects his great need. And we learn from this distressed father that he is in desperate need for relief, for this demonic spirit torments his son day and night. And so now moving from this scene where we have put ourselves in the shoes of Peter, James, and John, we put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples, now put yourself in the shoes of the Father. Helpless, hopeless, having to deal with his son's condition for who knows how long. And now on the brink of hope, he's heard of this great teacher Jesus, right? Word has spread all throughout the region of this guy who's healing people, who's casting out demons. And oh, by the way, his followers have also been out casting out demons as well. So he's like, if I can just get my son to these guys, something's going to change. And yet, now on the brink of hope and relief, he's been let down. And you can almost hear the malign of the psalmist in Psalm 102 as his fathers cry. Psalm 102, 3 through 5 says, For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forgot to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. He's tired. He's desperate. 
And now hearing word of Jesus and the things he's capable of, his hope is peaked. And now he's let down again. I think that in this conversation, we see that there is definitely this father and son are knit at the heart so much so that it's almost as if the father is suffering through what the son is actually suffering through. Because as the conversation goes on, it's not help my son, he needs help. It's we are suffering and we are in need. Can you help us, Jesus? So it's obviously weighing on him to the point of even having physical effects of his own. And I think at this point in time, he's coming to Jesus almost like if you've ever been at, 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 at Walmart or whatever store or whatever, and you're like asking around for help, and, or maybe you're trying to return something, things aren't going well, and it's just like, you know what? I can see that this isn't going well. Can I just talk to your manager? Like, that, I feel like that's kind of the attitude of this father, right? He's been with the disciples, the nine of them. Maybe they've go, gone down the line, you know, trying to cast this spirit out of this boy, and each one's failed. And he's like, you know what, guys? Thanks for trying, but can I just talk to your manager? Like, the guy, who's the guy in charge here, right? And I feel like this is such an interesting predicament, and we're going to dive into this idea a little bit more because Jesus has given the disciples authority to cast out demons. We've, we've read about it earlier on in his ministry and earlier on in their ministry in Mark chapter 6. We read that he sends them out, that they can minister, that they can heal people, that they can cast out demons, and so they do it. And so what's happened? Another observation from David Gusick, he says, in the eyes of contemporary, and this points to kind of the superstition around casting out demons and whatnot, but David Gusick points out, in the eyes of contemporary Jewish, Jewish exorcists, this was a particularly difficult, if not impossible, demon to cast out. This was because they believed that you had to learn a demon's name before you could cast it out. And if a demon made someone mute, you could never learn his name. Interesting. As I was saying this week, it was also pointed out that as we read Ephesians 6, and we'll get there in a little bit, that as it talks about the principalities and the powers of this dark age, that, that there's almost levels of authority in the, in the demonic realm, that maybe even there's levels of, of power in the demonic realm, that there's maybe lower level demons and higher level demons. And so this demon probably has a lot of experience and has learned that, hey, if I just stay mute and stay deaf, I'm never going to have to answer questions, which means I'm never going to have to leave. Some interesting, interesting stuff. And so from a human standpoint, this situation is impossible. You have an extra tough, possibly experienced demon versus inexperienced and green disciples with the outcome being an unsuccessful attempt at exorcism. And now the father is not only more desperate than ever, but most likely more discouraged than ever as well. And yet, in his lowest point, he finds himself in the perfect place. And that is where? In the presence of Jesus. In the presence of Jesus. I was reading through the Psalms trying to find like kind of this psalm of just heartache and crying out and I found Psalm 18. I came across Psalm 18 and I kind of title it as like a, a psalm of deliverance because you have I think a picture of what this father is going through and then you have a picture of God showing up on his behalf. And so Psalm 18 reading a big chunk but verses 1 through 19 the, and it's a psalm of David. So David's writing, he says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. 
I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me, and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. And this is where God shows up, and it's so cool. It says, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support, and he also brought me out into the broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The best place to be when we are in need is in the presence of Jesus. Even, and I will say from this account, even in our doubts and even with our disappointments, it is better to go to Jesus than to try to avoid him. Jesus can work with a little faith, but he cannot work with no faith. So take your little faith, even if you're hurting, even if you're suffering, even if it's hard, take your little faith to Jesus and watch him do big things. And as we see this father pour his heart out to Jesus, we see that Jesus is compassionate and enters into conversation with him regarding the sad state of his son. So the father says, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he, that is Jesus, answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. We don't know, like, the age of this young man from childhood. Maybe he was, you know, around 12 or 13 years old when the de demon possessed him. Now maybe, you know, late teens, early 20s. Don't know. Don't know. We just know that he's young and that this demon has possessed him from childhood. And Jesus... <laughs> it's so amazing to watch him interact with people because... He there's so many emotions going on inside of him. I mean, and so we put ourselves in the disciples' shoes, the Father's shoes, and now if you put yourself in Jesus' shoes, which is very, can't even do it, right? But like, thinking about Jesus and, and, and just him knowing how things should be, like the purity of creation and how how God created it, and it was good. And now we come to this point, he's confronting evil head on, and it's like, he knows that this is not how it's supposed to be. And so if you think about all of the emotions that could possibly be going on inside of Jesus, he's, he's angry, for sure, with Satan and his demons and the things that they do. 
He's frustrated with the people and with his disciples and how he's been with them for so long and yet they don't understand and yet he pushes his anger, his frustration aside and shows compassion for this father like sitting down like like a good doctor would and just pressing in and asking him, man, like, how long has this been going on? How long have you had to, to deal with this? First, though, Jesus has to deal with his disappointment. And he uses this opportunity to rebuke those presents. Have you learned nothing? It's almost like he says, how, how much longer can you witness these works of my hands? How much longer can you hear the teachings from my lips and still remain unchanged? How long? How long? I know that I, as a father, I've come to this place with Hudson like, how many times do we have to go over this, bud? Just one more time, I guess, right? Some argue over who Jesus is addressing here, and I think that, in my opinion, he's addressing everyone. The crowd, the disciples, the Father. He's, there's no, it, it's not like he's looking at one group of people. It's just a wholesale, like, how long am I going to have to... <laughs> How many more times do I have to say it, right? Warren Wearsby illuminates some light on if Jesus was pointing his phrase to the disciples. He says, no wonder the Lord was grieved with them. How often he must be grieved with us when we fail to use the spiritual resources he has graciously given to his people. Man, that's heavy. And yet, through it all, Jesus just graciously and compassionately just says, bring him to me. Bring him to me. He doesn't need anybody else right now. Just bring him to me. Jesus is our ever-present help in time of need. When the world fails, when people fail, when even our own hearts fail, we may take comfort in coming to Jesus. He is all will ever need. And as the boy is brought to Jesus, the presence of Jesus draws out the presence of this evil spirit. And in a last ditch effort to cause destruction, the demon throws him down and puts him into this seizure. And he's not going quietly or easily. A couple observations to be made on demon possession slash the desire of Satan and the forces of darkness. Number one is that within the dark spiritual realm, within Satan and the demons, they have a desire to distort and deform the image of God. Alistair Begg observes, whenever demonic possession is manifested, it is always for the same purpose, to, destroy, to distort and destroy the image of God in a man. And then number two, a desire to wreak as much havoc as possible for as long as possible. Matthew Henry observes, we may put another construction upon it, that the devil raged and had so much the greater wrath because he knew that his time was short. Revelation 12.12 12 tells us, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So this demon has every intention of destroying this boy. Why? Because he is an image bearer of God. Genesis 1.27 tells us, So God created man, and this is mankind as a whole, male and female, He created them. God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. And so, demons and Satan have it out against humanity because we are made, we are image bearers of God. And so they have this desire to destroy it because they don't like it. Every day they wake up and they see people as a reminder of what God has done, how God has created man in his own image, with a desire to have a great relationship with them, and yet it's their sole purpose and sole desire to just cut that down. 
And we see also that this demon has no intention of leaving peacefully. It's going to hold on as long as possible and do with the intention to do as much damage as it can before it's done. But we see Jesus, the caring physician, come on the scene, and in his presence, no demon holds power. It says in verse 21, so he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childbirth, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many even said, he is dead. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus says. As Jesus comes on the scene, we don't see the unnecessary hurry of someone who is just there to get things done. He isn't insensitive. He isn't even grumpy. As he has every right to be, right? Right? I mean, you feel like he could have come down the mountain, seen the disciples, seen them working in their futility, and just been like, boys, what are you doing? But he, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. And in fact, he does just the opposite. And he invests in this father. I, I, I kind of picture Jesus sitting down with him, and he's like, hey, let's sit down. How long has this been happening? How long have you been hurting? I want to help you. And as we hear from the father, it is evident that, this, that his son's ailment is in a way his as well, as I already noted. And he says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And just this connecting nature of the father's phrases that the boy's affliction has become his own. And it's as if they're both suffering under the boy's heavy weight of this just condition and just his torment. But Jesus is not only about the physical condition of the boy. And this is what makes Jesus so great is because he's not just about delivering the boy. He's also about investing in this father. And so he sits down and we see the conversation shift from the physical ailments, what's going on with your son, to the heart of the matter, what's going on spiritually, and we need to talk about your faith, Jesus says. Up until this point, the Father has only had interaction with Jesus' disciples and the scribes. The disciples are willing but lack the power. And the scribes are both unwilling and callous toward the whole situation. Toward the father, the boy, towards the disciples. It's all just, they're callous. The, the disciples are discouraged. And so it's all just a big mashup of just doubts and now disappointments. And I think that within this picture, now when he is brought to Jesus... His doubts and fear cloud his ability to even believe that there can be relief anymore. It's like he's past, he's past relief at this point. Can anything be done? I don't think so. It's kind of his conclusion. And I think for us as believers in Christ and as image bearers of God, this serves as a warning for us as Christ followers. We are an example of, are we an example of the power of Christ in us? Can the world around us see the evidence of Christ in his work? Or are we a stumbling block to those in need? Does our life and work only bring up more doubts and questions rather than 
relief and answers? Because at this point, the disciples are not helping. They're hindering. And I want to clarify all of that by saying it doesn't all depend on us and our perfect performance. Because if you try and put all the pressure on yourself, you put yourself right in the place of the disciples' shoes at this point. Because they're trying to do it all on their own. It's all on their own. They're all just working, trying to do it all by themselves. They haven't even given Jesus a second thought, right? Because as far as they're concerned, he's on the mountain, they're in the valley, and so he, they're just trying to work as hard as they can, do as much as they can, and it's all failing. Doesn't have to, it, so it doesn't, everything isn't hinged on our perfect performance, but we do need to keep in mind where our source of help comes from. The disciples failed because they lost sight of this fact. And we have every opportunity to succeed when our greatest priority is to point others to Jesus. Matthew Henry, in referencing a uh, prior event in the, in the gospel says the leper was confident of Christ's power, but put an if upon his will. If thou wilt, thou can. This poor man referred to himself, to his, referred himself to his good will, but put an if upon his power. Because his disciples who cast out devils in his name had been nonplussed in this case. Thus Christ suffers in his honor by the difficulties and follies of his disciples. And so let's talk about faith and this big if that we find in the narrative. Because here we see an example where we can come away with questions that may need clearing up. How can this man be able to receive from the Lord what he asks, right? It's almost like he's asking, and yet he doesn't have, quite have the faith. And isn't there a pow passage in the Bible about asking and not doubting? Like, I've heard that before, right? And you're right. James 1.6 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And so we come to this point, it's like, man, didn't this guy doubt? And so how is Jesus able to come and, like, come through for him? How does this whole faith thing work? And in order to clear this up, I'm going to share with you a couple observations from my studies this week. David Guzik makes a couple points saying, The man seemed unsure if Jesus could do anything, but the if wasn't in, in regard to what Jesus could do. The if was in regard to the man's faith. David Guzik also says, In this case, the man's unbelief was not a rebellion against or a rejection of God's promise. He did not deny God's promise. He desired it. However, it just seemed too good to be true. Another one from David Guzik, Hell, my unbelief is something a man can only say by faith. And finally, and a final observation from Charles Spurgeon, he says, While men have no faith, they are unconscious of their unbelief, but as soon as they get a little faith, then they begin to be conscious of the greatness of their unbelief. And there seems to be sort of a qualifier here, and I think that we see this that we see in this situ that we see this situation is best summarized by David Guzik's thought of this man seeing any sort of remedy is too good to be true. It's too good to be true, Jesus. I've tried everything. I've even come to your own disciples, and it just feels like it's not going to happen. It's been a long, dark road, and now having any hope of light just seems out of reach. Like it might not even be real. And yet, I think that, so we have kind of a, 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 a crisis of faith that this man comes to, right? And what I want to point out is that you can have a crisis of faith. You can have a crisis of faith. But the most important thing 
to do when you have that crisis of faith is to stay humble. Because if you all of a sudden your pride gets worked up and you get kicked up and you get proud in the presence of Jesus when you're having this crisis of faith, all of a sudden he can't do anything for you. You're trying to do it all on your own, and it's all on your own effort and your own work, and he can't do anything for you. And yet what we see of this father is that he has this crisis of faith, yet in humility he's willing to admit that he's on the edge of belief. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. You know, if we're if you're a numbers person and are into numbers, you know, and maybe you're thinking like, "Hey, can you put a number on it?" Maybe this guy's like, "I believe two percent, but ninety eight percent of me needs help. Help my unbelief, Jesus." And I think that his faith is evident in his willingness to admit his doubts. And what a humbling place to be. A place that I should strive for in my own life, in my own times of doubt. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I don't think he's done anything wrong. He's just being humble and being honest. And if you want to grow your faith, there has to be, I don't know, like the ingredients of growing your faith are humility and honesty. If you're willing to be humble with Jesus and honest with Him, He can grow your faith. Another verse from James, James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Jesus is able if we are willing. It takes a willingness to come to Him. It takes a willingness to make a request of Him, and a willingness to make a confession to Him of my lack of faith. Jesus is able if we are willing. And ultimately for this man, the big if turns into the big done, right? As a crowd begins to gather, Jesus rebukes the spirit inside a boy and with a seizure and a shriek, the demon is gone. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, There is no need for Jesus to talk to the Spirit. There is no need for a name. He just commands him with his word. I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the Spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. For Jesus there is no superstition, only authority. Only authority. There is no need to procure this demon's name or identity in any way. He simply commands the demon to be gone. Jesus has absolute authority and Jesus has final authority. Matthew Henry observes, Let him not only be brought out of this fit, but let his fit never return. Note, whom Christ cures, he cures effectually. Satan may go out himself yet recover possession, but if Christ cast him out, he will keep him out. And I believe wholeheartedly that as this boy is relieved of this demon and he falls on the ground as though dead, when Jesus picks him up, every scar that he had, every burn that was put on him by this demon, he was fully restored at that moment in time. It's not like Jesus just gave him relief from the demon, I believe that he gave him full relief because that's what Jesus does. He restores to the full. And this event becomes for us, again, a physical physical representation of a spiritual reality. For as we know, the state of mankind, the default setting of mankind is in a state of spiritual captivity. There's no neutral ground. We are either apart from Christ and under the control of Satan and the dark forces of evil, or we are set free by Jesus and transformed into adopted sons and daughters of the light. And I'm not just spitballing this. This isn't just an idea from Nate, but Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians 2, verse 1, Paul writes, And you he made alive. 
who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And you look further on in that passage, and it just talks about the restoration that Christ brings. So the default setting of humanity, it's not... There is no neutral. You are either for Christ or you are against Him. And the default setting of this boy, he, he is this physical picture of what's going on in the spiritual state of, human, of humankind that there is no one righteous, no, one, no not one, no one who seeks after God. And so it comes to this point where the, a decision have to, has to be made where you are no longer in the darkness, but in the light. And it comes from Jesus' restoration. Alistair Begg, some observations from him. He says, I actually wittingly or unwillingly was fulfilling an agenda, an agenda that actually comes from the dark side, from the ruler of the kingdom of the air, who is, he says, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So that this male malevolent spirit and don't misunderstand this for demonic possession. But the malevolent spirit, the anti-God spirit, is not out somewhere in the stratosphere floating, but the anti-God spirit possesses the lives of those who live by the ways of this world and follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. But we have the opportunity in Christ to be redeemed by him and made new in him, and the boy fell to the ground as though dead because he is now dead to his old life his old life of being demon-possessed, and we have to die to our old ways in the old world, and then Jesus brings him to life anew by the touch of his hand. That is the case for each and every one of us. But the story isn't over here, and quickly, I wanted to touch on the conversation to follow between Jesus and the disciples. It says in verse 28, And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, because they lacked humility. They couldn't talk to Jesus about it openly. They always have these like big conversations with Jesus where they failed. And they always talk about Jesus in a private setting. Like, Jesus, we don't want the, the crowd to know that like we don't get it. So we're going to talk to you about this in private. So they come to Jesus. His disciples ask him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. What we see from the disciples is in their futile attempt to cast out this demon is forgetfulness and a lack of devotion. Like we pointed out earlier in Mark's gospel, we are told that Jesus had given his disciples authority and power over evil spirits, and the ability to cast them out. Mark 3.15, Mark 6.7, and 6.13, it talks about Jesus sends them out, gave them authority over evil spirits. Yet here we find them unable to accomplish the task. What has changed? And I want to point out that my kind of assessment of the situation is that they have grown distant from Jesus and their confidence has shifted. They are no longer relying on the power of Jesus as their source, but they're relying on their own power. Yet, they are powerless against the rulers and evil forces of the dark realm because it is only by Jesus and it is only by His power in and through the believer that we are... that we're able to have any authority accomplish any sort of freeing work of God's kingdom at all. And so what the disciples have done, they've neglected Jesus. They forgot all about him. 
It's like whenever they were away from him, he was out of their mind. Jesus is gone. So they have to do it all on their own. And so the question then becomes, all right, what does prayer and fasting have to do with it? And I want to point out from the get-go, prayer and fasting, this is not like some secret sauce that you mix together and you can accomplish anything, right? It's not like back to the future. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish just about anything, right? It's not like that. This is not a secret sauce. It's not a secret recipe. What do prayer and fasting have to do with being able to accomplish the will of God? And it is this. It cultivates prayer and fasting. The practice of prayer and fasting cultivates an attitude of dependence on Jesus. So, again, what it's not. David Gusick clarifies, it isn't that prayer and fasting make us more worthy to cast out demons. It is that prayer and fasting draw us closer to the heart of God, and they put us more in line with His power. They are an expression of our total dependence on Him. And Warren Wiersbe adds, Jesus already gave them the authority to cast out demons. Yet, the authority that Jesus had given them was effective only if exercised by faith. But faith must be cultivated through spiritual discipline and devotion. Like I said, there's not some secret code that we unlock by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting are not for the purpose of like strong-arming God or getting Him to bend to our will. Rather, by putting into practice consistent prayer and even consistent fasting, we humble ourselves and admit our great need for assistance from and full dependence on our great Savior, who is Jesus. When you commit to prayer, when you commit to fasting, you are committing to humbling yourself before Jesus and admitting, Jesus, without your help, I can't do it. I can't do it. Fasting in prayer, I believe, equals spiritual discipline and attentive humility. Prayer, the spiritual discipline of praying, and then the attentive humility of fasting where we let go of something that could hinder us and bring, it brings us to a place of acknowledging our need. Jesus, I need you. Oh, how I need you. And that's it. Humble yourselves before Him. I think that's kind of what this idea of prayer and fasting is, and we see it played out in the life of Jesus, because we know that He didn't do anything apart from the Father's will. And so we know that He's been in prayer up on the mountain. He's been feasting on the Father's Word. And so, he lives out this example of what being prepared in prayer and fasting can do. It gives you power in the Heavenly Father. And in all reality, Jesus is the only one who is able to cast out demons. And what the disciples had got wrong is that the power was in and of themselves. But this is incorrect. And the power is always and always has been and always will be only a product of their dependence on Jesus. It was His power working in and through them. So in closing, I just wanted to make a point and stress the importance of dependence on Christ. Because without Him, we can't really accomplish anything. And it would do me well to come to the realization of my lack of power without Him sooner rather than later. So just some closing thoughts for you as we go from Gino Geraci. It's a bit wordy, but bear with me. He says, We are given a glimpse at the power of demons to wreak havoc on a human being. Sin has brought sorrow to the whole human race. Suffering is everywhere. Evil powers are at work. Here is a young person in deep trouble. Tormented by a demon, here is a father deeply troubled and sorely tried. 
And here is the testimony of several people who have tried to help and failed miserably. The child is helpless. The father feels hopeless and despairing. The disciples are surprisingly impotent. What happens when we as servants of God have no power? What happens when we live a powerless life or have a powerless ministry? No power means embarrassment and shame. No power causes the world to question, belittle, and ridicule, and ridicule the gospel. No power causes the world to question the validity and authority and identity of Jesus. The Bible and God's ability to deliver. The answer to no power comes by faith. Seeking, prayer, and fasting. The answer comes by yielding and being filled with God's Holy Spirit. And I felt like this thought from G. Campbell Morgan was great because he does what the passage should do, and that is point it all back to Jesus. He says, he, Jesus, found disputing scribes, a distracted father, a demon-possessed boy, and defeated disciples. He silenced the scribes, comforted the father, he healed the boy, and he instructed the disciples. And just as Ephesians 6.10 says, and this is what I will leave you with as my final encouragement this morning, because it it summarizes the whole thing. Because Paul is setting up, right, this idea of the conflict between the realms of spiritual darkness and spiritual light. And he gives us the reality of that realm. And then he gives us the reality of the armor of God. But Ephesians 6.10, as he's setting it up, Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not by our own might, not by our own works, but in the power of Christ Jesus and His might. That's how this boy was relieved of his demon. That's how this boy, that's how this man was relieved of his stress and turmoil. That's how the disciples were taught. And that's how the crowds were silenced, was by the work in the hand of Jesus. Jesus, thank you for this morning, for your word and your works that are given to us as an example of your great power, that we can read them, rely on them, take comfort in them, and know that you, Jesus, want to work in and through us that same power. And I thank you, Lord, for your compassionate heart. It tells us in your word that you're the the father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. And in turn, we're given a charge in that same passage that tells us so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Lord, our world's in a state of hurt. It's broken. It's fractured. There are a lot of evil forces doing a lot of evil things in our world. And so, Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, your church would be a a place of comfort, that your church would be a people of comfort, And that by your Holy Spirit and by your power we could confront the forces of darkness. That there would be a flicker of light, a flicker of hope in this world. Help us be faithful for the call that we can fulfill it and fulfill your work. But Lord, I also, I can't go away without praying. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Because 
I too, I also look forward to the day when you're just going to wrap this whole thing up when it all comes to its great and glorious end, and when everything is made right, when you are rightly glorified and rightly praised. And so, Lord, I just thank you for the promise of that day. Help us to be a people that look for it and look forward expectantly. And yet with that in mind, that we could also be people who are present and willing to minister to a lost, dying, and hurting world. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. And it's in your mighty name we pray. The name of Jesus.